We're going to talk about general revelation. My aims tonight are that we would understand the nature and importance of general revelation and its relation to special revelation. And we're going to answer some common objections to the study of general revelation and hopefully get to showing one basic thing about God that is clear to reason from general revelation. So general revelation, broadly speaking, that term is what I'm talking about, refers to what can be known about God at all times by all people through ordinary means of knowing. And so this is in contrast to special revelation, which has not always or is now available to every person. So some relevant scriptures. Um, there's lots. These are three that I like. Romans 1, 19 through 20, which is sort of the test um, the, the case that, they're, that, that the philosophers that I read, this is the most used verse that they, they argue from. And it says, For what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. And we're going to unpack that kind of phrase by phrase as we go along. The second verse is Acts 17, 26 to 28, where Paul says, of course, Paul wrote Romans too. Paul says again in Acts 17, another kind of um, aspect of it, from one man, this is when he's on Mars Hill, speaking to Athens, the Athenians, the intellectual group there, from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And then Psalm 19, you probably know, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. And, you know, even as far back as Augustine, you know, he has a view even uh, and he's a great theologian, philosopher for, West, for the Western tradition. He says, some people, in order to discover God, read books. But there is a great book, the very appearance of created things. Look above you, look below you, read it. God whom you want to discover never wrote that book with ink. Instead, he set before your eyes the things that he had made. Can you ask for a louder voice than that? So what is, the, what is the problem we're trying to address here? And um, it's if we take the scripture seriously, then Christians should be able to show what is clear about, about God from general revelation. But if general revelation isn't clear, then unbelief is excused, right? Because God says it is clear, therefore you're, you're not excused from believing in God. But, but so actually it is, it's a problem if we think general revelation isn't clear. Um, I, I wanted to say, I, you know, I got interested in this topic. Uh, was it la last spring when we did gospel objections? Who was here for that? And we did the salvific problem of evil, which was um, what about those who've never heard? And remember we studied like, three or four views, and each view had a view, had a, had an understanding about general revelation. And, um, and they, it was kind of assumed. So I, I, it wasn't like we saw that they were arguing for, for their view, but they had an assumption about general revelation. And so for, for, that's what kind of got me interested in reading and studying about it. But if general revelation isn't clear in regards to what we talked about then, it would be more, you would be more likely to believe in something like inclusivism or pluralism or universalism in regard to salvation. So you get me? So that's kind of what the context of this whole conversation. Um, the oh, these are the primary resources. So I, I, I got interested in these two guys, two philosophers, 
Um, Dr. Gangadine, he just passed away, and then Dr. Owen Anderson. <clears throat> and they're, they're very interested in this topic of it can, can, is it clear that God exists? Can we know that from general revelation? So I wanted to read their works. This is their stuff. Um, and if you're interested, I'll let you, I'll let you have my, my books. I, I, I loan everything out. But the disclaimer is I'm not an expert on this topic. <laughs> this is back kind of the extent of what I've been reading. And we're just going to think through it together and discuss it and, and probably have some more discussions about it. So we want to define some terms first. Um, what kind of knowledge is Paul talking about that, that uh, everyone should know? And uh, so in the verse again, he says, God's eternal power and divine nature has been clearly seen since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So it is not first-person direct awareness, knowledge by acquaintance, experiential, religious experience knowledge. It's not knowing God directly. It's propositional inferential knowledge. It's really what is on offer. Um, it's what you would call third-person propositional knowledge about God, right? So God is not saying he's going to reveal himself to all people directly or everyone's going to have an encounter with God or an experience at this point. What, what you're not excused from is knowing about God, that he exists. So it's a claim that all people at all times can have a basic knowledge about God through inferential propositional knowledge from studying creation. Now, clearly, God desires more than that, right? This is a mere thing that Paul's talking about. You, you should at least know, right, this knowledge about God. So um, God clearly desires further personal relationship. First person, direct, uh, I would say knowledge by acquaintance, that kind of direct um, personal knowledge. So, and those who respond to God by trusting in Christ have more than this propositional knowledge. John 17, 3 says, Now this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. They know you. That's different than knowing about, right? And of course, um, Job says, My ears had heard of you before, but now I, I understand, I see you. So that's, that's the kind of knowledge we're, that God is really seeking. So for Gangadin, he says the basic things about God are clear when we choose to use our reason. So he's not saying that all things can be known about God. He's not saying that everything can be known about God from general revelation. Um, he's just saying the basic things can be known. And this is the first step in coming to know God personally in a father-child, father-child-like relationship, personal relationship. And it's kind of, have you ever heard of the thing that um, you believe that so that you can believe in? You believe that, things about, so that you can trust in God? So it's that difference between believe that, believe in. Um, let's see. Well, some argue that unbelievers don't need propositional knowledge about God. They just need to encounter God directly. And certainly, I'm sure you have, I have heard testimonies of unbelievers encountering God in direct religious experiences, encounters. Um, the question, you know, might be, did they have a concept of God and, and believe God existed prior to the encounter? I, I mean, some probably did have a, con have a concept that God existed, and then they still didn't actually believe or trust in him and then had this encounter. But most of the time in our relationships, in our normal relationships, we have third-person knowledge prior to first-person knowledge. Um, I read a paper uh, by Brandon Rickabaugh, and he says... Um, 
take for an example a third person, third party referral for a doctor. My husband and I are looking for a primary care physician. So we're asking people around College Station, you know, who's your doctor? Do you like your doctor? And such like that. So what are we doing? We're getting third party knowledge about doctors before we actually decide who to go to. You might do this for a car mechanic. I was going to say Trey. Doesn't he have a broken car? Yeah. Like you would find out who, because you know, you want to have a good trustworthy car mechanic before you go put put your car in the hands of someone who's going to charge you a lot of money for fixing your car. So a seeker like myself first acquires propositional knowledge through third person you know, arguments or, or evidence uh, about a would-be relationship that I'm going to have. Does that make sense to you? Does that ring true? OK. So in these cases, it, it's the imparting of propositional knowledge through testimony or formal evidence um, that aid you in stepping out into a trusting relationship with trusting your doctor, trusting your car mechanic, trusting a friend, a, someone you're going to get to know. Okay. Anyway, is that is that are y'all tracking with me about the two different kinds of knowledge? Okay. So what does Paul, what does Dr. Gangadine, Gangadine mean by clear to reason? Because the, the Romans verse says, God's eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So he means that knowledge is possible by using reason and argument. Now, both of Anderson, Owen Anderson and Dr. Gangadine spend a lot of time arguing for the value or that or the um, that you that we have we can use our reason like he argues against Hume and Kant who argue they argue against our capacity to know anything about God by reason so by reason and I'm not going to go through all those arguments but by reason he means the laws of thought and generally, he's just talking about the law of identity, the law of non-contradiction, and the law of the excluded middle. And um, you can think of reason as the common ground for all between all thinkers in all of our dialogue, people who are thinking, reason is the common ground. But reason doesn't actually persuade even though you might think re reason is what persuades you. Reason isn't, is, doesn't persuade. It clarifies and tests for truth. And that may be persuasive, but reason clarifies things and tests for truth. In the end, there remains the choice. <coughs> you have the choice whether to accept the deliverances of reason. So the, the you know, it's up to you. So some may object and say, but isn't our reason fallen? Don't we have, isn't our reason just fallen because we're broken? And I would say our use of reason and whether we choose to use our reason is affected by the fall. But the laws of thought, those laws, the law of identity, law of non-contradiction, they're not fallen just like the laws of mathematics aren't fallen, right? Um, so, um, we, we're fallen in maybe choosing to use our reason, but reason itself isn't fallen. Does that make sense? Everybody? Yeah? Our ability to reason properly, maybe. And we have to have more tests. We have to have more, we, we probably don't, don't, um, uh, accept what we're what we reason just automatically we have to have more tests or defeaters or it's more difficult for us to reason yeah. fairly maybe we're a bit more tended to you know bias. motivated reasoning bias yeah. that kind of thing that makes sense I think so but we can say that the 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 laws of thought and are like the laws of mathematics in that way they're not fallen um, so someone might say, but isn't faith against reason? And of course, we've talked about this. But um, <clears throat> it, it, we should say it again. 
Knowing by faith is contrasted in, ele- in Hebrews 11.2 with knowing by sight. So by, it says, by faith we understand that the universe, universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. So faith means you're committed to reason and accept a conclusion without a visible verification. Does that make sense? So it's knowing by faith is, is contra knowing stuff, knowing things by sight. Um, Gangadine and Owen Anderson are responding mainly to two extreme views about knowledge. They're, they're countering skepticism on the one hand and fideism on the other, two opposite extremes. The skeptic says we can't know anything about God, and the Phidias says claims that we can believe God exists without evidence. So you could also say Ganganine and Anderson are offering a different view than knowing God via the census divinitatis. Have you all ever heard of that? That's Calvin. I thought I had Calvin on here. No. Uh, or uh, belief as proper as as uh, let's see, I lost my place. Or the idea that knowledge of God is properly basic. Or again, and also against the idea that we only know God exists through religious experiences. Now, clearly, they're not saying you can hold a true belief, but they're saying it doesn't count as knowledge if you can't show it's true with evidence and reason. In other words, you could, ha- you could hold a true belief, right? But you wouldn't count it as knowledge uh, if you couldn't, if you didn't have any evidence for it. The other views that I mentioned there, they they avoid the need to show God exists. So for these two guys, knowing means showing. So to know it, you need to be able to show it. That is, everybody can have a belief, but you wouldn't count it as knowledge if if you didn't have evidence and reason. Does that make sense? So often we, we, we would, I, I don't necessarily disagree with the views that I uh, mentioned there, but they would be beliefs you would hold that would need to have evidence, or they could have defeaters to them. You could have a false belief, uh, and that you could have a religious experience and believe the wrong God. So you would need to have um, evidence. We use reason to study everything, and so Gangadin claims we're able to reason about God before coming to Scripture. And what we're asking from general revelation is very basic. Can we distinguish God from other things in creation? And you can know this before you get to Genesis 1-1 because Scripture from the very beginning assumes God exists already, right? Our, the Bible, the special revelation, assumes God exists. So we, we can think about this, and God you know, reveals it in general re- revelation before, if, even if no one had a Bible. Okay, are you all with me? Some 90% of Christians don't know God exists. <laughs> they're not that they don't know. They believe but don't know. And they wouldn't care. He, they, well, I don't. Do you think ninety percent of Christians don't have that knowledge? You do. Yeah. Well, the problem with that, and which, which is why Russia Christie exists, right, is that um, if you hold a belief and it's not anchored by evidence, then it can walk away from you. You can, it can easily leave. You, you can hold a true belief, but it's not anchored in evidence, then it's not, you don't know it. It's not knowledge. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's kind of why, why we, or why, why we do things at Rush Hill Christie. What? I've heard very little in school. <laughs> why? Because it's not anchored in evidence? Yeah, I cannot explain why. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's a good question, uh, Michael. Um, I probably believed for a long time um, and held true beliefs, but didn't ha- did, w- wouldn't have been counted as knowledge for me. So. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> did, we, did we go through this? Okay, well, what about 
Um, how is he understanding the concept of God? Since they're making sense of Romans 120, this is a Christian claim that they're trying to defend. But they want to, uh, what they, what Gangadine wants to say is that we can use our reason to form a concept of God apart from the Bible. And that's just reflecting on, on what is the nature of the greatest imaginable being worthy of worship. This is like the God of the philosophers. But, um, you know, this being maximizes all the great making qualities like power, knowledge, goodness, and exists eternally without equals. That would be the kind of definition that they're defending, that they're, try that they're trying to say we're going to discover in general revelation. Um, but the concept of God they're showing from general revelation is really the God of Christian the theism. And they, they pretty much use uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism. You know, God is a spirit who is infinite, eternal, unchanging in his being, power, knowledge, and goodness. But I, I would say, I think you could begin, if you were an atheist, if you were an unbeliever, and you were just coming into it cold, I mean, I think you could say, uh, uh, you could have a concept of God that's as, as general as the being that is creator of the universe. Um, you know, but, but they're going from a philosophical, you know, concept of God. So why does it matter? Why are, why are we getting our panties in a wad about, you know, general revelation? <coughs> well, if unbelief in God is without excuse, general revelation matters, right? And ig ignorance is not an excuse. So, and that seems harsh. So, in other words, knowing that God exists is something I should have known. It's that kind of knowledge. I should have known God existed from what I know in general revelation. We have the same idea in our laws. And we have any law, law people? Any pre-law? No one's going into law? Okay. Well, you can be held responsible in, in a court of law for something you should have known because it's clear to all reasonable persons. Did you know that? Did you know you, e even if you say, I didn't know, but I didn't know. But if you should have known, you can be held responsible. Like there's contributor, contributory negligence. If you don't wear a seat belt and you have a car accident, you are partly responsible for your injuries. You know, I mean, we understand that, right? Culpable ignorance is not excused if your ignorance is blameworthy. In other words, you should have known X something because this knowledge is available through a reasonable amount of effort. A reasonable person knows this. You should have known, you should have known this. You could be held responsible. So the clarity of God's existence is an internal claim of Christianity, um, maintained by Christianity, it, and defeaters skepticism about God's existence and the and, or skepticism about the ability to know know God must be dealt with. So it's an internal claim to Christianity, but it should we should be able to answer skeptics uh, that that are skeptical about God's existence or skeptical, skeptical about the ability to know God, we have to deal with these kinds of objections. Ultimately, the claim is that unbelief is culpable ignorance and requires redemption, which is why we have redemptive re revelation. Um, so to challenge this claim, this Christian claim, the skeptic need only show that God is difficult to know or not knowable. And this is our topic for next week, which is Schellenberg's divine, is divine hiddenness argument. We're going to talk about that against God's existence. So if we neglect general revelation, we'll make mistakes in our understanding of redemptive revelation. Since scripture begins by assuming God exists, the content of special revelation is the nature and the need for redemption. Right, So since, since special revelation isn't available to all persons at all times, 
it's not sufficient to establish the guilt of unbelief. General revelation establishes, uh, establishes our guilt of unbelief. Does that make sense? Right? Um, our root sin and the cause of every other sin is not rejecting the Bible. It's the sin of not seeking or understanding what is clearly relieved, be, revealed about God and his creation. So that's Romans 3, 11 through 14. Our root sin is not seeking God and unbelief, right? That's the root sin of, every, of all of our other sins. And so the other thing, three, the third reason of why it matters is general revelation helps adjudicate which holy book affirms this God, this God that's revealed. Um, general revelation provides a framework for determining which books claim to be special, which books that claim to be special re revelation are in fact special revelation. Does their concept of God answer what is eternal and the attributes of God, or do they contradict what is known about God from general revelation? I'm thinking of like Eastern religions, Hinduism and Buddhism. Do they contradict what is known from general revelation? Yeah. Well, we're fixing to find out. We're fixing to look at it. For God is eternal, or there is one eternal, so Hinduism would, would uh, believes that matter and spirit are both eternal, I think. Or spirit is eternal, not matter, but spirit, yeah. And, um, yeah, so that, that would be, you would, you, the, the basic, one of the basic things we're going to um, hopefully talk about in just a minute, um, that they would both, all Eastern religions would contradict that one attribute. So that would be an easy way to na start narrowing down. And really, it's just theistic religions that are left. So, so let's answer some objections. Um, the first one is the first one is is tough. General revelation is vague knowledge of God. And you think, well, yeah, it's probably you probably get something like Plato's Demiurge or Aristotle's Unmoved Mover. That's about as far as you can get. You can't get to the Christian God. You can't get the God of Theism. And an, an, the analogy that most people use, or a lot of people used to use, is the blind man and the elephant. Have y'all ever seen that analogy? I hate this one, but anyway, it's just that they they each experience part of the elephant, elephant, but claim it as the whole. However, um, this analogy is based on empiricism and also um, on, on, a, on a material being, right? And it's knowledge from sense data about a physical being. Also, have you, do you have any blind friends? Has anyone ever seen, I, I had a blind friend, you ever see a blind person, in, uh, if you give them, give them something to look at and inspect, do they only inspect one part? They don't. They don't at all. <laughs> they have to inspect the whole thing, right? So these blind men are kind of silly. This is just silly talk because they wouldn't stop at the, I, I mean, that's my critique of this thing. They wouldn't stop at the trunk. They would, they would look at the whole thing. Katie, did you have a comment? Yeah, my question was just going to be why do you hate the analogy? I think you've answered it sort of good. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, Regarding the concept of God, the basic foundational attribute uh, that they're going to look for is eternal, and, and we're we're gonna we're gonna kind of sort this out. But there are really only two views among all the system: either all is eternal, or only some is eternal. And we'll work through these views in a moment. But we can. We can agree that the first step toward clarity is to distinguish the concept of God as eternal from things that are not eternal. That, that's, their, that's their method. So this is very similar. How they begin is kind of similar to Josh Rasmussen, do you think, Katie? I mean, um, when we did The Bridge of Reason or uh, Can Reason Lead to God, can, um, what was the book? Can, how, how Reason Can Lead to God? Re what is it? 
God to lead can reason, yeah, whatever. Um, did, were y'all here for that? Katie did that la last semester. Um, I feel like their method is very similar to the bridge of reason that Josh Rasmussen does. Um, so the other object, the second objection is, well, knowledge of God is innate apart from reason. It's just an innate knowledge that we have as human beings. And so innate in this sense means intuition or an awareness of something greater than yourself. Uh, and we're talking about innate as a non-cognitive awareness of God and experience maybe, um, and you've probably had this experience, experience of creation like a sunset, the stars, the ocean, the mountains, an experience that you have of creation. Um, that would be sort of an innate, not, uh, you would call that innate knowledge. But on this view, how would you show that God is real to someone else from that specific experience? You could describe it, right? I mean, had, have y'all experienced that? You just experienced creation, and it's sort of an, um, you treat it as innate knowledge uh, that there's a creator. No? Yes? Yeah, I think it's pretty common. But to arrive at knowledge, remember, for, for gangadine, you can't, you can't know it unless you can show it by evidence. So this is a little bit hard to show by evidence when you've got an innate in, uh, experience. So try to, to arrive at knowledge, we need to use reason and to make inferences from the things that are made and then conclude that God exists. In other words, knowing means you can show it. Um, and Gangadine emphasizes that the first step in all of this is to show, be able to show that something is eternal. Okay, the third, oh, this is, this is John Calvin. He, he, was, he was big on, on this too, which is not bad. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with this, but I see, do you see where they're going with it? It's hard, it would be hard for you... Uh, in our church, it's like they went on a um, they went on a mission trip, and all the youth got up and they explained how they shared uh, the gospel. But when they but the way they shared the gospel was just they shared their personal testimony, experience. They just shared their experience with people. But that's not exactly sharing the gospel, right? So this is this is kind of the same. I'm not saying that your testimony is not important. But do you, do you feel me? You get me? Okay. So, okay. Um, the other thing is general revelation is unnecessary for salvation. And I would agree with it. <laughs> Obviously, we agree with this. And they do. It's not exhaustive knowledge, nor is it salvific. The Bible is a redemptive revelation. But how do we know the Bible says true things about God? right? How do you know your, the Bible says true things about God? We need the truths of God from general revelation to prove that the Bible, rather than some other holy book, reveals God. What about the Old Testament who were redeemed pre-Bible? I guess some of them had specific revelation direct from God. Yeah, but, they, but they, like, do you talk about like Abraham? Like Job, Job, even. Because Job wasn't an Israelite. No, he and wasn't. He was blameless and upright before the Lord long, like 38 chapters before he ever Of course, you from could God. say that God revealed himself in a whirlwind to him and spoke to him. But. Right. Like Job was righteous before that. Well, and, and yeah, yeah. He was seeking God and, and worshiped God, sacrificed to God, says he was righteous. Yeah. yeah. Specific revelation, which. Well, I guess what we're saying here is uh, we don't know about Jesus or redemption from general revelation is really the... So the objection is general revelation is not really important. We don't even need to know anything about God from general revelation because we have the Bible, right? And I, I, do, I do disagree with that. I do agree that obviously it's not... <clears throat> I don't think general revelation is salvific as far as... Um, knowledge of Jesus or redemption. Um, but that's a good point. 
That's a good point. General revelation shows us God's eternal power and divine nature and that we are in need of redemption, right? It shows us we're guilty of the root sin of unbelief in God. So in the little bit of time we have left, I want to show you what, how they, so their entire project is to start with what is eternal and go all the way to God's goodness and, the, and um, respond to the problem of evil. So it's a big project, but they start with this, bit, with this basic thing. And their deal is you have to agree on what's basic, and then you build. That's good. It's kind of like Josh Rasmussen's Bridge of Reason. He's building. So the most basic concept is, is ontology or being, existence, whether something is or is not. So what has always existed in the past and will always exist in the future is what we call eternal. And what has not always existed is not eternal, but temporal. An eternal being, which we're trying to understand, right? An eternal being is logically and ontologically more basic than a temporal being. So ontologically, what is eternal is the source of what is temporal. So the first question that has to be answered is what then is eternal? That's the basic question, what is eternal? And the answer to this question is your most basic belief. So does there have to be something eternal? Someone might say, well, it doesn't have, there doesn't have to be anything eternal. What if, what if there's nothing eternal? So that would be the view that no, nothing is eternal. The opposite of something is eternal would be nothing is eternal. And if none is eternal, then all is temporal. All had a beginning and came into being. And if all came into being, then being came into existence from non-being. And being from non-being isn't possible. Now, they spend a lot of time arguing for this premise right here and uh, against the objections raised. But being comes from being alone. Non-being is the absence of being and has no power to cause anything. That's, I mean, pretty common sense, but this is a big premise to, to, that you might have to defend with someone. Because to assert uncaused events is rationally unintelligible. Do you ever run into, Michael, do you ever run into anybody who wants to assert uncaused events? So this might not be that hard, but I mean, this is basic. If you're in physics, um, what, is anybody physics? F physics? You know. I mean, they might want to say there's uncaused events. But belief in causality isn't an empirical claim. It's not known by observation. It's a necessary condition for intelligible, intelligibility of the world and thought. In other words, we can't have dialogue. You can't say something and I can't respond unless we believe in causality. You're causing a thought. I'm thinking in that, you know. You can't go from premise to conclusion without having a ca causation. So um, belief in causality is actually a necessary condition for thinking, for your own thinking and dialogue with people. Um, an uncaused event, so some people will say, well, wait a minute, an uncaused event, you're saying that God is an uncaused being. Isn't that an uncaused event? But an uncaused event isn't the same as an uncaused being. An uncaused being is an eternal being. So it's not the same as an uncaused event. Katie? Does this work if you pause it for one moment and time doesn't exist? Say again? If you pause it, the time doesn't exist, can this still work? And why would you want to pause it that time doesn't exist? I'm just curious because I, have so, I know some people who are questioning time right now. Oh, well, we haven't talked about time. It's a big topic. Did y'all cover that when you when you were in Colorado? Did you talk about time a lot? No. no? 
just stand if time doesn't exist? Because time would have to come into being without a child. Well, I mean, they would say time is just an illusion. And so the whole like coming that, into being or out of being thing might not make sense. That's just like someone bringing up quantum mechanics. <laughs> if they want to say some random thing that they don't understand. Okay, most four dimensionalist views are still going to disposit that there's a front half to the four dimensional cube, in which case the argument rules just it's an illusion. Okay. It's what is your argument for premise three? It's an illusion. If everything's temporal and comes into being, then being came, comes into existence from non-being. And that came from something before it. Oh, and well, ultimately. So then, yeah, yeah. You, you would still have to get to non-being, right? Yeah, yeah. It all in the ultimate chain, right? Non being eternal ish. No, because then it would be it wouldn't be non being though. Non non being wouldn't be wouldn't. If it wouldn't be eternal, eternal, but it would be like pre existing. Not pre existing nothing. Yeah. Then the chain have to remain existent and why can't it disappear sometime after? Pop in, pop in and out of existence. Well, it would just be like, so there's the first thing that was uncaused, it did its job, and then it went away. Uh -huh. I, think they, I think they would argue that, that it's, it's unintelligible. But that, that is, I think that they say, I, I didn't, you know, they spend a lot of time on this, and if y'all want to get into it, I can give you the, the, you know, I can study more, or you could study the book. But I do know you, you, would, you would probably have to argue for these things. I'm not saying, I'm giving you the frameworks of, of where they're going. Um, and I think there are arguments for uncaused events. Is that, and that's what you're talking about, right? Uncaused events. That's just a 9-3, or that's a 9-4, because you're asserting that there's an uncaused being, right, or a, a being that's coming from non-being. Well, if it's uncaused, it's not coming from non-being. It's, it's not coming from anything. Free. Well, but that's what non-being is. That's what 4 is, contra 4 is directly intended to contradict what you're saying. It's saying that's not possible. Well, then God wouldn't be possible, because God is a being. It didn't come from anything else. If you're defining any uh, uncaused being, uh, yeah, a being that came from no. He's not a being that came from. Yeah, he didn't come from non being. Yeah. He just was. He didn't come from it, no. Because he's, he's always existed. He's so, self existent. So, why is an uncaused being that isn't God violating for? Are you mean a being? Are you saying a being that never. an eternal being? No, I'm saying. So being, like, we'll call him Frank. So, Frank was the first being. Frank was not caused by anything. But it, but it did come into existence at the time. No, Frank no. was eternal, eternal until Frank disappeared. No. Because Frank disappears after he creates Fred. And then Fred creates Jamie. And Jamie creates quantum physics. <laughs> so you're, quantum you're saying that no, indiv no individual entity <laughs> is eternal, but the sum total of the chain of events is eternal. Doesn't even have to be. It could. The past could Asking be finite. Them. It could be that because time could have been created somewhere down in the chain too. Okay. I'm just taking an off. Since we only have two minutes left, I I get what you're saying a little bit, uh, but we'll grant that that none is eternal is not possible, but that something is eternal must be true. Can we can we go for do y'all want to go forward? Okay. But I will say they belabor this. They belabor this. They don't just hand wave this away. This was me hand waving it away because I, I knew we only had limited time. So but some would say, well then all there are views that are all is eternal. And you've got to deal with those too. 
So there's there's three really that you have to deal with, and we're gonna and I have to say this is the same thing. I've only have a, a limited um, response, but material monism is that all the material universe is eternal. This is the dominant view in the academy, you know, and it has a long pedigree. The pre-Socratic philosophers were mostly material materialists until Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle came along. They were dualists. Carl Sagan, y'all weren't born. Was anybody born in 1978? No, you were not. I saw this show, PBS TV show, 1978, and Carl Sagan, you've probably heard this, he opened the show every week, and it, he said, the cosmos is all there is or ever was or ever will be. That was his famous opening line. But the, the, the one of the, th and so they spent a lot of time, obviously, on material monism and arguing um, against it. But generally, if you're a common, if you're a lay person, you could think of it like this. Matter is not self-maintaining. If it were eternal, it would have to be self-maintaining. So the material world is governed by the second law of thermodynamics and has entropy, entropy. So there's increasing randomness and sameness in the physical universe. It's not self-maintaining. And the sun will burn out. It could not have been burning forever. It's not eternal. But you, then you think, okay, well, that's something, in, that's matter. What about the entire universe as a whole? Is it self-maintaining? So there's a theory of Big Bang oscillating universe theory. And that means there was Big Bang, and then, oh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to shrink back, and then we're going to have another Big Bang. And then you shrink back and have another Big Bang. Yeah, you're doing it right, yeah. Um, so th but evidently, there's not enough mass in the known universe to allow gravity to pull the expanding universe back in order for the Big Bang to occur again. So the universe will die a heat death, and it's not self-maintaining. So that's their, their um, answer to material monism, is that it can't be eternal because it's not self-maintaining. Then there's spiritual monism, which is uh, ancient Eastern um, religions. All of This is not matter, but all of reality is spirit, and it is eternal. So matter only just appears to exist. It's an illusion. Um, are, are your friends about time, are they Eastern religion? No. They're just wacky. Yeah. Okay. Uh, matter is explained in terms of the, of the mind alone. And the self, or the soul, only appears to be distinct. It only appears to be distinct from God. And this is where you get uh, belief in reincarnation. The soul existed before this life and will continue to exist in another life form after this life unless you obtain enlightenment. You all know about reincarnation. And so the, the response to it is, well, <clears throat> if the soul has existed from, if your soul has existed from eternity, if your soul is eternal, and this is what Plato thought, it would know all things because the soul would be infinite in knowledge, right? It would be gaining knowledge all that time. But my soul and your soul is not infinite in knowledge. So, I, I know, Jet, your soul is not infinite. <laughs> <laughs> that seems a little tenuous to me. <laughs> what? It seems a little tenuous to me. I know. I mean, they go, I'm telling you, they go into great detail. I'm just picking one little thing for them to say. Um, that your soul is not eternal. Eternal. It, it had a beginning. Well, because uh, that's what enlightenment is, right? You would, already be, you would already have enlightenment if you were eternal. Yeah. I think that's what they're talking about. Oh, I don't think they were talking about that. They were, they were talking about the real, what, like, he, 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 he was Hindu. He, 
He is, and he and he and he makes a big deal about this because he actually came from that um, religion. So I'm going to grant him what he, he knows on that. And dualism is just that both matter and spirit are co-eternal, not created. They're both eternal. And for reasons already given above, I'm going to say that one's false because we already discussed matter and spirit. So maybe we could say, we could grant that all his eternal views are logically in incoherent. So now we're down to only some is eternal. Oh, wait, how, how long do I have? Huh? What? Because they were like, huh? Three minutes? Andrew says no. <laughs> so, something, so we're down to this. Something must be eternal. Matters not. The human soul is not. Therefore, what is eternal isn't matter. It is a spirit who created the material world and the human soul and not from something that was already existing. So that's the first and fundamental attribute of God, his eternality. And belief in an eternal creator is, a th is they're equating that with a theistic belief in God. So that's how, do you see how they're getting, you know, they're going, you know, methodical. And believe me, they're doing a lot more argument than I gave. I just, you have to trust me on that. But going forward, they argue for all the other attributes of God. And basically what they say, that one of the hardest things is you have to have a response to the problem of evil then even even on this view you've got because you can view you you because general revelation also gives you that problem of evil just like uh you know probably more than than the bible but i mean you know you've got to have an answer for the problem of evil and uh, besides the character of god and that is about god's goodness right you've got to argue for god's goodness so Okay, so did y'all, that was one minute on the, so you kind of, I just wanted to give you a taste of what they're talking about, and I don't think it's a, it's a, uh, I don't think it's an easy project, but I think that it's important, like we said before, because if we can't show that you can know basic things about God from general revelation, then we can't make that claim in Romans 1 that says people are without excuse, right? You, you, and then you would, have a, you would have a different systematic theology about salvation and things like that, I think. So if general revelation isn't clear, then unbelief is excused. Unbelief is inexcusable because the according to Gangadine and Owen Anderson, because the basic things about God are revealed in general revelation. And we should be able to show what is clear about God. And of course, the knowledge of God from general revelation is a guide to the true holy book among all the world's religions. So it also helps you say that the Bible, the reliability of the Bible.